Today is a special day, um, not just because it's our last day in the fellowship hall, but we are halfway through our journey through the book of Revelation. Um, no, nothing? Okay, whatever. I'm excited about that. I guess my excitement will have to carry me through. Um, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 11, the first 14 verses today. There are notes in your bulletin. I uh, encourage you to take notes. It helps you to remember uh, and store up what God's Word says. Uh, there are also free notebooks available to anyone that would want one for those notes to go in, just so you have a convenient place for them. Uh, today we're going to talk about an area of Revelation that is one of the most uh, debated areas in Revelation, uh, the identity of the two witnesses. Uh, so i tell you what we're going to do. If you have your Bible, I'm just going to read in Revelation 11, uh, read the entire text we're going to go through today. Um, and I know uh, we had a little bit less music today, so you should, be ob- you should be okay to do this. Can we just stand in the honor of, pre- of the reading of God's Word today? Revelation 11, I'm going to read the first 14 verses. Then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for forty-two months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for twelve hundred and sixty days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the sky so that the rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying, and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate, and they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. Then they went up into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies watched them. And in that hour there was a great earthquake. And a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake. And the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Join me in a word of prayer. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would illuminate your text today. Revelation is, in one way, the most simple of books. The point of Revelation is clear that Jesus has ultimate victory. And yet, for all of that simplicity, the book of Revelation is also one of the most complicated books for us to understand. It's wrapped in imagery, it's wrapped in apocalyptic and prophetic language, and so it has caused much confusion in the church and those who have preached it in numerous different ways. Lord, I pray you would give me, by the Holy Spirit's anointing, the ability to preach clearly the ability to preach simply, and Lord, to not say a word that's not right from your heart. Lord, I pray that you would bless us as you promised to do when we study the book of Revelation. Lord, I pray that you would meet the needs of the hearts of the people here. If there's someone here today whose heart is not right before you, Lord, I pray today that, Holy Spirit, you would be relentless in pursuing them, calling them by name, and that today would be the day of their salvation, their repentance, or their return. Lord, I pray for those I know who have a burden in my church family, for people that they know that are far from you. Many of them, it's their children and their grandchildren, but Lord, it's our neighbors and our co-workers. We pray that you would unleash revival starting in our homes, starting in our sanctuary, starting in our hearts, and Lord, that this would be a year where we would see many, many people place their faith in Christ and be born again to life abundant and eternal. We pray you bless the preaching of your word. We ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Everyone can be seated but me. I don't see how that's fair, but you know, (laughs) I can't teach sitting down anyway, so it's fine. There are several key things here. Uh, The most important thing will be the dealing with the two witnesses, but there are some things that happen before and after that that are also worthy of 
studying. Uh, we go through the Bible verse by verse, and uh, I believe that's the best way we can do it. So let's first look at the threefold measurement. There's kind of this strange section of Revelation. I mentioned to you that um, there are seven seal judgments, and then seven trumpet judgments, and then seven vial or bowl judgments. They are called vial or bowls, depending on who you're asking. And before the seventh of each of those judgments, you get an interlude. You get a, a pause for us to catch our breath. And we saw the first one was rather short. It was only a chapter. But this interlude that we're seeing goes on for about five chapters. And so we're still in the interlude before the seventh trumpet is finally blown, unleashing the seven bowl judgments. But there's some things that happen in the midst of that. Um, by the way, I think it's worth pointing out here that as a prophetic book, Things don't necessarily happen in Revelation in chronological order. It can be kind of a hodgepodge, and I think we see some of that here, because we don't know exactly how long these two witnesses are going to be in operation. We're going to see some numbers here. I just want you to keep that in mind, that this may or may not fall in a strict ABC chronology. Prophetic literature can be um, ambiguous when it comes to time. Let's look at this measurement, though, and I think this is a pretty interesting thing. Look again at the verse 2. The first two verses of chapter 11. Then there was given me, this is John the Beloved speaking, a measuring rod like a staff. And someone said, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Just to help us understand this, John is given a rod like a staff for measurement. They couldn't just go down to Home Depot and buy a tape measure. They didn't have one of those apps on your phone that you can just measure things. So what they did in the ancient world is they used these rods, these giant reeds, and they used them as basically a, a rough measurement. And that's the picture that's given here. Um, we see similar things in prophetic literature in the book of Ezekiel, for example, where he's to measure the temple in Ezekiel. And the same thing is really happening here in Revelation. It's interesting to note, though, that there's no actual measurement provided. It doesn't say it's this large or this many people. Um, that should be an indication to us that this is not about the numbers of inches and feet or even the numbers of people in there. There's something else going on here. I want to show you what that is. First, I want you to notice the threefold measurement. What is John to measure? There's three things. First, he's to measure the temple of God. Secondly, he's to measure the altar. And then thirdly, he's to measure those who worship in the temple. There's three things that are to be measured. By the way, that should also be a hint to us that this is not about length, height, and width, because you can't measure people, or you could, but I don't think that what Jesus is saying, hey, we need to know how tall people are in the congregation. And we certainly hope they're not doing circumference, right? <laughs> Say, John, mind your business. So I think that's a clue that this is not about length, height, and width of the building or the people. So what is happening here? Um, and by the way, the imagery here seems to be rooted in Israel. It's the Jewish temple. It's the Jewish altar. And we're going to see that in a moment. The court of the Gentiles is omitted from this measurement. This seems to be peculiar about the people of Israel. And we've seen that in our study in Revelation already as well. Here's the cool thing. When I was studying this, this is what I found, that in the Bible, oftentimes measuring something was a way of demonstrating ownership over it. And I believe that's the main takeaway here. Not the specific dimensions of these things and these people, but rather to show that these things and these people belong to God and are under His sovereign authority. We see that in a couple ways in the context of Revelation chapter 11. Notice in verse 2, that when John is told what to measure, the very next thing in verse 2 is what he's not to measure, and he is not to measure the court that's outside. This is undoubtedly a reference to the court of the Gentiles in the temple. If you're not familiar with the way the Old Testament temples were, uh, they had what was called the court of the Gentiles. It was the farthest place from the Holy of Holies. And if you think about the temple as there was the closer you get to the Holy of Holies, the closer you got to the presence of God. The court of the Gentiles was the farthest place removed from that. And so what that meant was if, if you were, say, a Samaritan or you were a Babylonian, but you became a proselyte, you became a worshiper of the God of the Hebrews, they would let you worship in the temple, but only so far. And by the way, it's why we as Gentile believers should rejoice that at the crucifixion of Christ, the veil was torn. There is no court of Gentiles in the new covenant. 
In fact, we, said, we saw this last week in Hebrews. We are told to come boldly to the very throne of grace to find the help that we need in that moment. But in the Old Testament, if you were a Gentile, no matter how fervently you loved God, no matter how much you desired to worship God, you were an outcast even in the temple. And that's undoubtedly the picture here. Again, this seems to be an indication that something's going to happen in Israel because the nations are in the court of the Gentiles, and that's another matter we'll study in a moment. And again, measuring something has to do with it being under authority and ownership. I want to say this because... It doesn't feel this way, but theologically, Orthodox Christianity has maintained that even now, God is sovereign over his universe. It doesn't feel that way because wickedness is still present, and evil is still present, and Satan is still doing his stuff, and the world is still still doing their stuff, and, and there's so much that seems wrong. But even now, God is sovereign over his universe. But I want to tell you, there is a special authority and a special relationship that God has with his people. So, so the question, and it may, not, it may seem surprising to most of us, but we have a modern-day quandary in theology. Does God love sinners? Well, yes and no. Does God love sinners like he loves his children? No, there's a special love that God has for his children. There's a special relationship that God has with his children. Does God love everybody as his creation? I believe so. But there's a special love. Like, for example, we get this. You may love all children. But you don't love all children like you love your children. I have a heart for children. I, I, I can't stand a child to be hurt or abused or neglected. It angers me. But the two children that God has entrusted to me, they have a special love from their Abba, their daddy. And we have a special love from God. The whole universe is under God's sovereignty. But the only people that are living like they're under God's rulership and authority are the people of God, the worshipers of God. And I love that picture here. The world is going to do what they do. But the people of God, they're under the ownership, the protection, the authority of the God who redeemed them. And can I just encourage you today? Um, This is not just true in the tribulation. If you are a child of God, if you claim to be a child of God, what that means is not just that we go down and say a prayer at an altar and get dunked in a weird bathtub in front of people. And I don't mean to diminish baptism. It's a sacred thing. We're going to do it next week, praise God. What I mean to say is it's much more than just a past time event that happened in the past. No, the life of the Christian is to say, Lord, you are the Lord of my life every day, and I need to grow closer to you. Jesus says it plainly, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Meaning, if you want to know where you are in your relationship with God, where do you start? You look at your obedience to the Lordship of Christ in your life. And where there are areas, as there are in all of us, where we fail to be obedient, We need to repent, and we need to seek the Lord. But I want to just tell you, do not fall for the lie that so many people in the Bible Belt have fallen for, that it's all about what happened in the past. Beloved, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you are in danger today. And I'll tell you what, I need the grace of God every day. Not just the day that I came to Him, but every day since. I'm going to tell you what, when you go through the hard things in life, you better know that you need the grace of God. You better know where your help comes from. You better have faith that even though it hurts and you don't understand that there is a God who loves you and he's working everything out for your good and for his glory. We need to cling to Jesus every day. I'll get off my soapbox. Well, I'm not. I'm just going to get on another soapbox. That's what you pay me for, after all. Um, As I thought about this idea of the court of the Gentiles, it reminded me of Psalm chapter 2. So keep your finger here in Revelation chapter 11. I want you to go all the way back to Psalm chapter 2. Psalm is the longest book of the Bible, so it's pretty easy to find. Uh, And then... Uh, just find chapter 2, which uh, is somewhere towards the beginning. Psalm chapter 2. I'm going to read all 12 of these verses. Uh, I believe that this is prophetic. Um, It's also just true of human history and the the war of the flesh and the world versus the kingdom of God. Psalm chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 1 and read all the way down to verse 12. I'll give you a moment to get there. Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. Why are the nations in an uproar, and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from this. I want to pause there because I want you to understand, in the poetry, we might not understand what's being said here. But look at verse 2 again. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. The word anointed is literally the word Messiah. 
The Messiah means the chosen one, the anointed one. So the world, the, the rulers of the world say, we are going to come against God and his anointed, his Messiah. And notice what they think about God. And this will sound familiar to us. Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. That's the picture of bondage and slavery. These people have the understanding that so many people in our world today say that, that God is just a tyrant that wants to give you a list of rules and reign on your parade, and we're going to be free, and we're going re- to remove the shackles that he set on us, and he's going to make us free. I want to tell you, the most unfree person is the person who is a slave to sin. It is true that we are all slaves of something. We are either slaves of sin, Paul says in Romans, or we are slaves of Christ. But there is no such thing as freedom apart from Christ. In fact, Paul says in Galatians, it's for freedom that he set us free. So freedom is found in the will of God, not against him. Go to verse 4. This is God's response. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king, Jesus, upon Zion, my holy mountain. Just to sum that up there, you can buck against me all you want. You can try to remove the fetters and the cords. You can try to be free, but guess what? It doesn't change a thing. My king that I have set on the throne is on the throne, and you can't do anything about it. One great preacher said he, you can't impeach him, and he's not going to resign. And that's what the psalmist is saying here. He's the boss, no matter you like it or not. Look at verse 7. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord, he said to me. Now listen, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Again, this is all about Jesus. Verse 8. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, notice this, the parallel. We're going to break the fetters. We're going to rip the cords off. The psalmist uses that same idea, that same language to talk about God's judgment coming. That he's going he's to take like a, in a room full of you know, fine china, he's going to take a metal rod to it and just break it. Your fighting against God means nothing. Look at verse 10. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Look at verse 12. Do homage to the Son, that he may not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. I love the way that psalm ends. Because if you're like me, we kind of... We kind of you know, get a little upset about the whole breaking things with a rod of iron, right? Jesus is going to come and knock down all this stuff, and he's going to break this stuff with a, you know, a metal rod. I mean, we don't like that, right? That's judgment. That's, well, you don't preach that. No, no, no. But notice the end of it ends in an invitation. He's talking to the kings. Remember, they're the ones in verse uh, two that are talking about taking this war up against God. He, may, he gives them an appeal in verse 10. Therefore, because of what? Because wrath. Because God's wrath is nothing to play with. Therefore, O king, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. He's saying, don't do what you're wanting to do. Don't wage war against me because you're not going to win. Now, how would you love that to be in? Uh, some of you were in the military. You know that's not, that's not really the way that military strategy goes. Military strategy, you, you end the battle. And here's the king of kings saying, look, how about we just end the battle before it begins? Why don't you just tap out right now? Because if you don't, it's not going to be pretty. And I don't want to pour out judgment on you, but I will pour out judgment on those who are in sin. And then he goes on. I love verse 11 and 12. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Look at verse 12. Do homage to the Son. Some translations render it, kiss the Son. I mean, come to Jesus. Love Jesus. Place your faith in Him that He may not become angry and you perish in the way for his wrath may soon be kindled. Now look at the last last verse. This is a great way to end the verse. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. When I was studying Revelation this week, this passage came to mind because it's, I, I think, at least in some sense, prophetically fulfilled in Revelation. I think it's fulfilled in other areas of human history as well. Our, our whole human experience is the flesh and the world are at war with God and at war with Christ. And here is Christ who is the the object of their hatred and their attack and their rebellion and the king, instead of being vindictive, instead of wanting to hurt them or harm them, he's telling them in no uncertain terms, I will judge you, but I really don't want to. 
take heed and kiss the Son. Come to Christ. Because you see this double contrast here. His wrath may soon be kindled. Oh, but to be one of the people who is sheltered in him. What a blessed dichotomy. Go back to Revelation. I just wanted to point that out to you. And when we look at things on the world stage and all the chaos, you think of Psalm 2. Oh, why do the nations rage? Nations rage because they haven't submitted to Christ and his kingdom. Now let's look at the two martyrs in Revelation. I'm using the word martyrs because the word witness here is the word martyr in Greek. Uh, In the New Testament, that is the word. So when we see in Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses, that word in Greek is martyrs. And so I just want you to understand, I used that word intentionally, and it helped my alliteration, so that that made me happy as well. Um, But that's not really the main thing. The word martyr is important because if you are a Christian, you are called to be a witness of Christ, which means you are called to be a martyr. That doesn't necessarily mean that you will face persecution unto death. It could mean that. But let me tell you what it absolutely means in the life of every Christian is that you lay your life down as a living sacrifice and you let him live through you. That is the call for all of us. And I I know by the look on your face, you're like, nah, that's not what I want to sign up for. You're supposed to tell me how the gospel is going to make my life better. Oh, the gospel makes your life much better. But it also is a call to come and die to yourself so that Christ can live in you and through you. That is where the blessing comes. And I'm going to tell you, it's the hardest thing in the world, because our flesh wants so bad to be in charge, and our flesh wants so bad to be in control of our own destiny. And yet to be a child of God is to say, you know better than I, you are holier than I, you are wiser and stronger than I, and so I'm going to lay myself on the offering, Paul says in Romans 12, as a living sacrifice. Now, isn't that a contradiction? If you're a sacrifice, you did. A living sacrifice? It's the picture of day by day. You're the king. What do you want me to do? Who do you want me to be? How do I talk? It's when the Holy Spirit begins to convict you. You have a choice to make, beloved. You can either say, I'm going to do what I want to do, or you can say, Lord, thank you for convicting me. I'm going to try to fix that. And I may fall on my face again with it, but I'm going to keep trying to be transformed and changed to be the person that you died for, the person that you created me to be. Two martyrs. Now, let's look at the purpose of the two witnesses, the two martyrs first. We see that in verse 3 of Revelation chapter 11. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses. I love that. They're his. They're God's two witnesses. He owns them. He has possession of them. And they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. First notice their authority. God grants them authority. And remember, the previous verses was all about measure the temple, measure the people of God. Why? Because I have authority over my people. And then the very next thing, I'm going to grant them authority. It reminds me of what Jesus says in Matthew 28, verses 18 and 20, what we call the Great Commission. I'll read it to you. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Now listen, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus comes out and says, every bit of authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And notice what he does with it. He gives it to his children. I'm with you always. You're going to go out in my authority. And what's the purpose? The same thing for the two witnesses. You're going to go share the gospel. You're going to go preach the word in the power of the Holy Spirit under the authority of the king. That same king we saw in Psalm 2 is telling us that our mission in life is to go make disciples. I, you, know, I, you ever wonder, you ever wish that, you know, how much easier would it be if the moment a person got saved, we'd just be taken to heaven right then and right there? It'd make altar calls a lot more exciting, I can tell you that. Because half the people are like, sign me up. The other half people, I'm, I'm terrified right now. I don't know. But you know, why doesn't God do that? Because it's hard to live in the world as a Christian, isn't it? Every day our soul is, is groaning, the Bible says. We're, our, the creation's groaning and the Spirit's groaning and the people of God are groaning. And we're saying, Maranatha, Lord, come today, fix this mess that we've made. It's hard to live in a fallen world, isn't it? Here's why God doesn't do that, I think. Because there is a mission that God has given to his children. 
And if the moment a person believed they were taken to heaven, there'd be no one left to preach. There'd be no hope for anyone else. My friend, is it worth going through the difficulties of life in a fallen world so that you can be faithful to the King who died to save you? Is it worth going through the ups and downs and the hardships so that you can warn those in your family, those in your neighborhood, those at your job, that the wrath that we saw in Psalm 2 and the, the wrath we see in Revelation is coming, kiss the Son. Come to the Son. His arms are open wide. That is the mission we've been given. Notice their assignment is to prophesy. And here I feel it's necessary to explain to you what prophecy is in the Bible. This is one of the things we misunderstand, and when we misunderstand it, it it hinders our ability to understand the Scriptures. The Bible talks about prophecy in two different aspects. What you're most commonly thinking of, as we most commonly think of prophecy, is what we would call foretelling. That is to tell future events that have yet to happen. So you say, hey, the Babylonians are going to come, and they're going to wipe us out. That's foretelling. Much of Revelation, I believe, is foretelling. It's telling of things that are yet to occur. But did you know that the primary usage of prophecy in the Bible isn't actually foretelling? We often think it is because we don't know that there's an option B, but the the primary function of prophecy in the whole Bible is not foretelling, it's forthtelling. That is to take what we already know and proclaim it. The prophets in the Old Testament, look at what they said. Some of it was future predictions. But much of it was simply saying, this is what God's law says, and we are violating the covenant that he made with us at Sinai. Or this is what David said under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and we're not understanding that this is what God has already said. A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite writers and preachers, uh, influenced my ministry more than probably anyone else. He believed that preachers have a prophetic ministry. And I agree with him. Because right now, what I'm doing is not, hey, listen to what I have to say. I'm not that sharp. I'm doing well to get my own bills paid. I'm doing well to manage my own life. You come here for my advice, you in trouble. No, my job is to say, thus says the Lord, and to unleash the power and the Spirit-anointed Word of God. And so I pray every Sunday, God, get, get personality out of the way so that we can look at the Word of God. That's prophecy forth telling what has God said. And I believe that these two witnesses will do both. I like what John MacArthur says about it. He said, the two witnesses will proclaim to the world that the disaster occurring during the last half of the tribulation are the judgments of God. They will warn that God's final outpouring of judgment and eternal hell will follow. At the same time, they will preach the gospel, calling people to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that's what these witnesses are going to do. For however long they're serving, however long their their prophecy ministry lasts, they are going to be pointing people to say, this is God's wrath being poured out. But there's an escape in Christ. Will you come? Notice the time limit here, 1,260 days. Well, I did the math for you so you wouldn't have to. Uh, That's equal to 42 months, which is equal to three and a half years. Uh, Bible scholars that study the end times believe that the, the tribulation period will last exactly seven years, and it'll be divided exactly in half with two sections of three and a half years. And so we see those numbers that add up to three and a half years. During the first half of the tribulation, as we've already seen, the seal and trumpet judgments occur, and in the final three and a half years are referred to as the great tribulation, and they're even more severe than the first wave of judgment. And these two witnesses apparently are operating during the Great Tribulation. Also notice their attitude. Notice that the two witnesses are dressed in sackcloth. In all of the Old Testament prophetic literature, that was like the ultimate sign of mourning or grief or repentance, to to wear sackcloth and ashes. Imagine wearing a burlap sack and how uncomfortable that would be and irritating that would be. It was in the Old Testament one of the clearest signs that we were grieved or mourning or repenting over the sins of us and other people. So the attitude of these witnesses is not to come and brag, not to come and and insult. They're coming in grief. It's grieving their heart, and I believe that that is a reflection of the heart of God his heart being grieved, that his wrath is being poured out in such a terrible way. That's their attitude. And by the way, that should be our attitude as we preach the gospel to others. I had someone tell me one time that before he came to Christ, 
he had two different people share the gospel with him. And the first did it smugly and in a very uh, looking down on him manner, and he didn't get saved that day, largely because of the attitude of the person who was sharing the gospel. He said the next one was a little old lady who wept as she told me that I was going to be separated from God for eternity, and he said that was the day that I heard the gospel. We don't go around saying, oh, I'm better than you, I'm smarter than you, look, I'm God's child. No, we walk around in sackcloth, and we plead with people, repent, 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 because the wrath of the Lord may soon be kindled, but to take refuge in Him. Ezekiel says it this way, God says it in Ezekiel, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live, turn back, turn back from your evil ways. This idea that God is just up there looking for someone to smite, and maybe you feel like that today. Maybe you just feel like God is up there with your name in a book, and He just wants to throw lightning bolts at you. Beloved, can I just tell you something? When you study Revelation, when God wants you to know He's after you, you will know. This is not, I had a flat tire kind of stuff. This is not, I skint my knee or I stepped on a Lego kind of stuff. This is fire and brimstone and earthquakes and stars falling out of the sky. If God is judging you, there will be no question. God is not looking to harm you or hurt you. The saddest books in the Bible, written by the weeping prophet, Jeremiah and Lamentations. The book is called Lamentations because he's mourning. He's giving a lament. And in the saddest books of the Bible, God says to Jeremiah, I don't enjoy hurting people or causing them sorrow. God does not enjoy hurting people or causing sorrow. Now, He will use suffering as surgery to turn our hearts to Him. God would rather inflict pain on us now than have us deal with the infinite wrath in hell. And if you look at it that way, that's actually grace. That's actually kindness. Now, the question is, who are these people? Look at Revelation 11, verse 4. We see a clue, um, but I want to tell you, I don't know that anybody knows for sure. 11, verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. There you go. You came here, now you know. Right? Yeah, exactly. That's how I was when I studied this. Great. Two olive trees and two lampstands. That clears it all right, right up. Uh, I did not know this off the top of my head. Um, I'll share with you what that means in a second. It actually comes from the prophecies in Zechariah. But I want to tell you a couple of the options. Some people take these two witnesses to be merely symbolic. Uh, Revelation is a book filled with imagery, and often is the case that what you see is a representation, a metaphor for something else. So, for example, in chapter 1, we saw the, the seven lampstands. They represented seven churches, and we see seven angels in the hand of Christ, and they represent seven angels, possibly seven pastors of those seven churches. So, Revelation is a book filled with symbolism. So some people take this to be symbolic. Here are a couple of the options if you take that view. Some people say it's the Old and the New Testament, that these are a metaphor for the Bible. Some say it's Israel and the church. Some people say it's the law and the gospel, and their cousins say it's the law and the prophets. That's some options. However, I don't see any reason in this text to take this purely metaphorically. So I'm going to share with you that My view is that these are actually two people. They are actually killed. Their bodies are actually laid in the street for three and a half days. They actually prophesy. That seems to be, I may be wrong about this, so show me some grace if I am, but I believe that these are two individuals. The most popular view of that would be that this is Moses and Elijah. I want to tell you, we can't know for sure. I want to tell you uh, basically how that argument, that line of thinking goes, why people think that it's Moses and Elijah. Moses is the lawgiver, so he embodies the law, and Elijah is uh, considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest, prophets, so he would represent the prophetic order. So in that sense, they represent the law and the prophets. Moses and Elijah are considered the greatest Old Testament prophets. Both Moses and Elijah were prophesied to return in some manner. If you remember in Deuteronomy, uh, there's a prophecy that there will be a prophet like Moses that's even greater. Now that's a fulfillment Christ that fulfilled. Uh, Elijah was also said to have come back when John the Baptist was ministering. People thought he was Elijah reincarnated. So there are prophecies that suggest, in some manner of speaking, that both Moses and Elijah would come back in some way. 
Now here's where it gets interesting. Elijah, if you remember, never died. He was taken to heaven in a rapture-like event. The chariot of heaven came and picked him up. By the way, uh, it's worth noting that Enoch in Genesis also never died and was taken to heaven in a rapture-like event. That has caused me to consider, and by the way, I'm the only person I know that thinks this is even possible, so it's probably wrong, but it's made me consider that this may be Enoch and Elijah, since they both had a rapture-like experience and they never died, and then they're going to die, and Hebrew says it's appointed for every man a day to die. But again, I'm the only person that may think that, so it's probably completely wrong. Uh, Moses did die, but his, bur- his burial is mysterious. Uh, they don't know where he was buried and all these things. There's some shrouded uh, in mystery there. Probably the biggest proof is that Moses and Elijah are believed to have been seen with Jesus during his transfiguration on the Mount of Transfiguration. So it would stand to reason that Moses and Elijah could possibly be these two witnesses. That is probably the most popular view. However, what do we do about this tree and lamp thing. Keep your finger here, and I'm going to really stretch you today. Uh, You may need the table of contents. I want you to find Zechariah chapter 4. I will give you a moment to get there. Zechariah chapter 4. Now, how many of you thought today we'd be open in Zechariah? You're like, man, Zechariah is my favorite book. I'm elated. (laughs) But you can't understand what's happening in Revelation unless you understand Zechariah, which is why we don't understand it, because uh, we don't know Zechariah very well, and I'm I'm including myself in that. It's not a book that I'm very familiar with either. Zechariah chapter 4, go down to verse 12, down to 14. I'm skipping over the vision here, but here's, here's basically what happens. Zechariah is talking to the Lord. He's having this prophetic vision, and the Lord is showing him things, and, and he's, he's asking Zechariah, well, what, what do you see? And he says, well, I see, I see trees, and I see a lamp stand with seven heads, and, and, and he goes on basically to tell us what that means. And so that's the part we're going to look at today. Chapter 4, verse 12. And I answered the second time and said to him, what are the two olive branches which are beside the two golden pipes? which empty the golden oil from themselves. So he answered me, saying, Do you not know what they are? And I said, No, my Lord. Look at verse 14. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. See, there you go. Now you know. You're like, I still don't know who they are. I don't either. And nor do I think anyone knows definitively who they are. Again, traditional wisdom would say it's Moses and Elijah, that they are in the presence of God, and they have this special assignment. But again, as we see, the text is not exactly clear. What I can tell you, and it's the reason, you're like, well, why did we even go look at it, Pastor, if you're not going to tell me who they are? I've tried really hard in our study of Revelation to tell you the things I can hang my hat on. I don't know if it's Moses and Elijah. I don't know if it's imagery. There's a lot of ways we can view this. But there's a reason that it's quoting from Zechariah, and it's what I want to show you, what I can hang my hat on today. First, the context of this prophecy in Zechariah had to do with the rebuilding of the temple. That ties into the context of Revelation 11, where they're measuring the temple. By the way, there is no temple today, so if that's a literal temple, obviously one would have to be built uh, for those things to occur. Zechariah sees two images in his prophetic vision, two olive trees and a golden lampstand fed by two bowls of olive oil. Both of these symbols represent According to Zechariah, the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth, exactly as in Revelation 11. Well, what do these things represent? Well, I think this is pretty fascinating. Olive oil was used to fuel lamps. Lamps obviously provide light. But get this, the lamps are connected to olive trees, so they never run out of oil. They have a continuous supply of oil to to light these lamps. Now, power bills keep going the way they're going, that sounds like a really sweet deal. Just plant an olive tree, pipe into it, and let the oil feed into it. That sounds like maybe, Mark, you need to make some money and come up with that uh, and give me half because it was my idea. (laughs) You do all the work, my idea, and I get half. That sounds about right to me. The best way I believe we can understand what all this represents is spirit-filled ministry. The Holy Spirit is metaphorically referred to as oil in the Bible, and of course, light often represents moral purity and ministry. Go back a few verses if you turn from Zechariah. It's your fault, I didn't tell you to. Zechariah chapter 4, look at verse 6. 
Then he said to me, listen, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Meaning, what's, what's going to make Zerubbabel, he's one of the guys that rebuilds the temple, what's going to make him successful? What's going to make him prosperous in ministry? Not his strength. It's going to be the Holy Spirit giving him strength. That's the picture. Whoever these witnesses are, they're tapped into the Holy Spirit. And they're getting their strength and their ability and their authority from the Holy Spirit. Beloved, let me tell you what. In the new covenant, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit on the day we come to Christ. And we are to continuously be filled with the Holy Spirit. Like that lamp that's plugged into the oil that's coming from the tree. You and I are supposed to live in the authority and the ability and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I know life is hard. I had a great voice teacher. Go back to Revelation when I studied voice in college. and uh, Just a sweet, godly lady. And she would always say, Josh, you need to go out there and sing like you're somebody. Because I was very timid, and I would kind of go out there, and I just hated I just hated singing in front of people. She said, God, Josh, you need to go out there and sing like you're somebody. You're somebody. Let me tell you what. If you've got the Holy Spirit of God, you need to live like you're somebody. Because you've got the power of God in you. You think he gave you that just so you could sit on the couch and, you know, just watch football? I mean, that's fine. You need the Spirit in that too. That'll test your flesh like nothing else. But God called you to do great things. And he's not asking you to do it by your own intellect or your own power, your own, you know, he's asking you to tap into the Holy Spirit. That's the picture of the two witnesses. That's what I want to share with you today because I can hang my hat on that. Notice back in Revelation. The power of these two witnesses in verses 5 and 6. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouths and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the skies so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. I'm going to start with the end of that first because that's another reason people see Elijah and Moses in these two witnesses. Elijah was able to prevent rain for three and a half years, which again is the length of the tribulation period, and then he caused it to rain again by his prayers. That's the plague here that one of these witnesses has. The other one is able to turn the water into blood blood and all the plagues, and that of course seems to be a throwback to the Exodus and Moses. So again, another reason there. But what do we do with this whole thing about they can spit fire, right? Because it'd be easy to say, well, that's just mythological language. That's just metaphor. That's just symbolism. And it could be that metaphorically, this is an expression of the power of Holy Spirit anointed preaching that when we preach the Word of God, it's literally fire from heaven that comes out of our mouths. I don't think this should only be taken symbolically, but I want to tell you, as a preacher, that kind of makes sense to me. I love that. I'll tell, I'll tell Miss Rachel this. I, had, I have really weird shower thoughts when, you know, when I'm in the shower and the kids aren't bothering me and I can think through things. And, and I was going to take a picture of Miss, uh, Miss Rachel's Sunday school class, our, our older lady Sunday school class, and I was going to Photoshop it to make it look like it was a hip-hop album, because um, I had this idea of them spitting fire, you know, and I was going to put it up on the picture, but that just takes too much work, so you can use your own imagination. Um, and I think in a real sense, though, when we preach the Word of God, we are spitting fire. We are taking people to the Word of God and the heart of God, and there's power in that. And I think that's what this is meant to symbolize. However, I don't think it is only symbolism. There's nothing in the text here to say that this is not actually happening. They are seemingly bringing down physical plagues. So it's not, without, it's not beyond the scope of reason to say that this could be a literal punishment. I want to just tell you a couple things about it before we move on to the end here. First thing, I want you to notice that this was defensive, not offensive. These men were not going and just saying, hey, how are you doing? You know, it was when people came to harm them, when people came to silence the preaching of the word, they defended themselves in this manner, which, you know, like I get it. If you're the first guy, right? Oh, they're too old, weird looking guys. I can go take them. No, not so much. But to be the second guy, to be the third guy, The fourth guy, and there's like these charred remains there, like at some point, maybe stop trying to take these guys on. But again, their mission is to call people to repentance. And yet God has given them this seeming supernatural ability to protect themselves. 
Let's look lastly at the two miracles. I'm going to read from verse 7 down to 14 and then share some insights from each. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate And they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell upon those who were watching. By the way, there's just a couple of things that are important before we get to the main thing I want to talk about here. You will notice uh, that we see in these verses the first appearance of of 30 or so more, more than 30 appearances of the word the beast. Uh, the beast is a title of Antichrist, and we notice that he comes up from the abyss. That is to say, he is, he is partnered with the demonic in some way. Uh, it is not believed that the Antichrist is Satan himself. Um, that's a whole different thing, but the Antichrist is someone that has demonic influence in his life, best I can understand it. Now, before we go further, just, just catch the picture with me here. These prophets come, they, they're preaching, people try to shut them up with violence, They get consumed by fire. We don't know how long this goes on, but it's a pretty dramatic scene. Then Antichrist comes onto the scene. He comes into power. He's able to make war with them and kill them. So you can only imagine how that bolsters his approval rating. You know, we've been trying to get rid of those guys forever, and here you are, you got rid of them. And notice the scene here. They rejoice over this. Ironically, that's the only mention of the word rejoice in the whole book of Revelation. They rejoice that these men have died. In fact, they have an inverted Christmas party. Uh, Some theologians call it Dead Witness Day. They're giving presents to each other. Um, But before we go on to the resurrection, here's the question that struck me. Why do the people hate these witnesses so much? Well, the reason that's given is that they tormented them. But that made me think, because I've been preaching through this verse by verse for the last several months, and you remember a couple of chapters ago, we saw a demonic army was unleashed, and they were able to torment for five months. That's the same word in Greek. And at the end of that, remember what they did? They worshipped demons. So after five months of torment, they worshipped demons. But after however long of hearing the gospel preached by these men who tormented them, they rejoiced at their death. And that that just got me thinking, why did they hate them so much? And I think Jesus actually gives us the answer in John chapter 15, verses 18 to 20. You can turn in your Bible there if you'd like. I'm going to read it to you. Jesus says it this way, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Now listen, if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. I found this fascinating. That a person who is, who is literally hell-bent on rejecting God would worship demons after being tormented by them, but rejoice at the death of the people trying to show them how to have grace and rescue. There is this thought that, that people are inherently good. This thought that people generally are good people. And, and maybe you believe that. I grew up watching a lot of Disney movies, and that was certainly the, the thought behind that. You know, the Bible says that our flesh and the world are at war with Jesus. Let me, let me ask you a question. If you're a Christian today, do you still struggle with sin? Of course we do. Think about that for a second. You have been washed in the blood of Christ. You have been sealed by and empowered by the living spirit of the living God, and you still struggle with sin. There are still days when our flesh does not want to yield to God, and you've got all that going for you. What about a person who doesn't have the spirit? What about a person who doesn't have the forgiveness of Christ? What about a person who doesn't know the word of God? You think that their flesh is just saying, I want to be good, I want to be nice, I want to be kind. No, the world is hostile to Jesus. 
And these people are hated not because they tormented them. They're hated because they preach the word. And a dying world would rather be tormented by demons. And we see this metaphorically in our own day. I used to have a ministry where I preached once a week or twice a week to a a rehab place, alcohol and drug addiction. It was awesome seeing these guys go from addicts to be preachers, just watching God flip them around. But you know, they would start telling me when they would go talk to their previous friends about the change that God was doing in their life, their friends would scoff at them and reject them. And one of them said to me one time, he said, when I was an addict, all of my friends laughed as I was destroying my life. They partied and they celebrated when my marriage fell apart and when my family disowned me and when I was by myself and when I had nothing. But the moment I made a decision to do good for my life, they left me. See, the world is at war with Christ. The world is at war with the Word. And these people were hated, just as you and I will be hated if you love Jesus, if you love His Word. You are the nicest people I've ever known. I mean that. You invite my family into your home. You've invited us into your hearts. I love our church. I absolutely love you. But your kindness and your goodness that comes from your love for God and your love for Jesus will be a cause that the world will hate you. It's not fair. It's not right. But it is part of the cost that comes with walking with Jesus. And the more a culture gets in, entrenched in the darkness, the more that will be present. I want to talk to you about these two miracles. The first, there's several miracles here, but we're only going to talk about two. First, notice this resurrection. Now, I just think this is hilarious. I know you shouldn't laugh at the Great Tribulation, but I just, Miss Rachel tells me all the time I have a twisted sense of humor, and I, I do. Can you imagine this with me just for a moment? They, kill, they finally kill these two guys. They hate them so much. They leave their bodies on display in the street of Jerusalem, by the way. It tells us very clearly it's where Jesus died. It's in the city of Jerusalem. They leave their their bodies to rot in the sun, which in the ancient world as is today is like the biggest sign of disrespect that you can give someone. No burial, no, no sanitation even, right? And get this, the whole world watches. Now, 100 years ago, that was thought to be mystical, that it was some kind of, you know, image in the sky. We don't need that now, because now when things like 9-11 happen, when things like Afghanistan happen, the whole world is watching that on their television. So it doesn't even need to be mystical today. The whole world's sitting there watching. Hey, I got a present for you because the two guys are dead. This is great. And you just know that like three and a half days later, there's somebody with his bag of popcorn, like just watching the dead bodies. I think he just moved. Hey, hey, come here. Did you see that? I think he just Oh my gosh, he's getting up. Now, you imagine that moment? I mean, I think it's hilarious. God, if nothing else, he knows how to, he knows how to mess up people's minds, right? Everybody's watching, and they start standing back up, and you're like, okay, we were in trouble before. I can only imagine how mad they're going to be when we killed them. The breath of life comes into them. They stand back up. Lucky for the world, the voice of God, the voice of Jesus has come up here. It's the same words that we see in Revelation 4.1, which I believe is a picture of the rapture, where Jesus says to John the Beloved, come up here. Boom. He's up in heaven. Some theologians believe that there's some other kind of rapture event here where those who believe in God at the point in the tribulation get to dodge the rest of the tribulation. I don't know that that's true, but I know these two witnesses with the whole world watching. Now, you, now you imagine, you just watched them come back to life. They've been dead for three and a half days. That's scary. Then everybody hears the voice of the Lord come up here. Boom. You watch them take off Superman style. I don't know about you, but what would your response be to that? And then there's this earthquake that comes in the city of Jerusalem, devastates the city. But that's not the miracle that I want to show you, because there is a miracle here that I think blows my mind. I want to show it to you uh, in the last couple of verses. Look at verses 13 and 14. And in that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. Now listen to this, this phrase. And the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Now that phrase, as seemingly insignificant as it is, I think is very significant. Because in other places in the Bible, that is the phrase, to give glory to God, is always associated with salvation. So what's the, what's the, what happens here? I believe this is the case. I may be wrong, but I believe I'm right. 
These witnesses come, they preach the gospel. People try to shut them up. They get consumed by the fire of their mouth. Antichrist finally kills them. Three and a half days, they get up. They go to heaven. This earthquake happens. And then there's this group of people who have seen all of the tribulation judgments. They've seen all of these things. They've seen the witnesses. They've seen them resurrect. They've seen them go. And there's this group of people who finally tap out and say, all right, I get it. I'm on your team now. Now, I want to tell you, that excites me. Because in the worst possible display of judgment, God is still able to save people. I remember when I was a young preacher, I was a youth pastor. A pastor was preaching on end times things, and he gave a challenge from the pulpit, which thankfully in my youthful zeal I did not take him up on, uh, to show in Revelation where anybody gets saved in the tribulation. And I'm thinking, well, I see some places. And he said, come up here right now and show me. And I didn't. I felt, I feel, I tell Amber, I feel good looking back on that, that I wasn't dumb enough to go up there and do that. Um, but I see, I see here in the midst of the worst suffering and judgment poured out on the earth, there's still hope. And I want to share that with you as we close because a very specific reason. Because I know um, there's a joke that a, a deacon once asked a pastor, tell me what you know, pastor. And the pastor said, if I told you what I know, they'd run us both out of town. I have people come in my office every week, and I take it very, very seriously that they share their burdens with me, and they, they ask me for prayer, and they ask me for counsel. And so I don't know every burden of every heart here, but I, I have a good view of a lot of the burdens of a lot of the hearts here. And I, and I have prayed for and prayed with so many of you that are eager for your children to come to Christ, or eager for your spouse to come to Christ, or you're eager for whomever you love to come to Christ with tears in your eyes. And I want to tell you that when I read this, I thought of you, that even in the midst of judgment, that there will be a God whose heart is full of grace, and that as long as there's breath, it's not too late. And I can't guarantee that anyone will come to Christ in a specific way. I don't have that ability. I wish I could just snap my fingers and your loved ones would start falling in love with Jesus can't guarantee that, but what I can guarantee you, which I think is much more significant, is that God doesn't give up on reaching people until it's too late. I never knew that until I studied Revelation. That's been the big takeaway from me, that it's wrath. Oh, yeah, but there's still grace at work. And listen, we're not that bad yet, and so that means there's even more grace right now. Sometimes, some people and maybe you're one of them, it takes going through the worst thing possible for God to say, you're mine, and for a person to respond to that. Parents, can I give you some arrogant advice? It's arrogant because my children are young, and I pray for them every day. I prayed for them since before they were born, that they would love Jesus. I can only imagine the heartache you feel if your adult children are not walking with Jesus. That would tear me apart. Uh, so I, I, I'm at the risk of being arrogant. Uh, I think this is based on God's word, not my wisdom. Sometimes we do our children a disservice by protecting them from every negative consequence of their decisions, protecting them from every evil and every hardship. That may very well be the thing that God is using to get their attention. I mean, think about how you are a special kind of dense if you're this kind of person in Revelation, that you've been through all of this, and it took all of that for you to finally say, okay, I give up. I mean, that's, that's like going to the Olympics of denseness and meddling. That's serious headstrongness and stubbornness. It may be that the way to the cross is through brokenness. It may be that God has to break a person before he can mend a person. So can I give you a prayer if you're praying for someone and hopefully you are to come to Christ? Maybe it's your children, maybe it's someone in your family, maybe it's someone at your job, maybe it's your worst enemy. Can I give you a prayer that I have prayed and I've seen, it, I've seen God respond to it? God, break them down, but protect them in the breaking. God, God get them to the place where they're willing to look up. If you have to make them miserable, make them miserable, protect them. But the ultimate need of their heart and our heart is to be right with Christ. And I just want to share that with you because I, I, I am so grateful that people trust me enough to come and tell me those burdens and 
to weep in my office or in our living room. And when I read this passage, I thought, you know, they need to know that as long as there is breath in their lungs, there's an opportunity to respond to the gospel of God. I want to tell you, God has not given up on you. Maybe you're that person here today, and you're running from God everything you've got. I want to tell you, God has not given up on you. You may feel unloved, you may feel unseen, and God knows I feel that way often. But God has not forsaken you. God hasn't given up on you. We're going to have a time of invitation, and if you're here today, and you feel like the Lord's dealing with you in any way, I'm just going to ask you to come and talk to me. There's nothing special about that. You can come talk to me after service if doing it in front of everybody freaks you out. That's fine. But if the Lord's dealing with you today in any way, I just want you to yield to it. I'm going to tell you what, walking with Jesus is hard. It is, it is hard. But it is the most blessed thing that you can do in your life. It is worth it to go through the hardships and the struggles, to have intimacy with Jesus. You may have no one but Jesus at times, but Jesus is enough. We stand with us and pray and sing. And if the Lord's dealing with you, I'll be up here to talk and pray. The glory.